<laughs> Diabolical <laughs> Lab. Diabolical Lab. Welcome to the Stupid for Movies. I am Mark Kaiser. You are? Wade Major. Okay, here's the situation. Now, Wade and I are both members of the LA Film Critics Association. So we are not just dorks, we're learned dorks. Dorks who know what they're talking about. And on December 12th, Wade and I and the other 46 <laughs> members of the LA Film Critics Association will be voting on our year-end awards. Is that what you call it? Yes. It's chaos. You know. It's chaos. It's a uh, best actor, best picture, best director, the it's, whole thing. It's, it's like four dozen people sitting in a room, total chaos for four and a half hours until somehow we emerge with winners. So what will happen between now and December 12th yeah. is that Wade and I will probably, and I'm not kidding, we will watch between now and December 12th probably 30 movies. I've got on my list of must-see films that are all as effectively in contention, one of which I knocked off this afternoon, so I think I'm down to about 24. 24. Yeah. And then here's what'll happen. On December 11th, what'll happen is the, the, the night before we vote, we will go to sleep at like three in the morning because we will have watched six films that day, yeah. and then the seventh film, I will probably call you and say, should I watch this movie or not yeah. because I just have to go to sleep. And then if it, you like it, I'll have to watch it. A few it. years back when we gave Caché Best Foreign Language Film, I actually watched that at 2 in the morning the night before we voted. And there's a, that moment in Caché, you know, where I, I audibly screamed at about 3 in the morning. But what big movies are we reviewing today? Oh, there's oh, movies. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody need to follow the breakdown. Hey, it's a really big show. We wait should talk about Harry Potter immediately. Yeah. Paul no, Tompkins wait, immediately. Wait, why would I talk about Harry Potter when I got all this stuff to do? On yeah, producer yeah, yeah. Mike's yeah, rundown, yeah. may no. I say. Uh, la, quickly la, la, introduce la, la. yourself. Okay, hang on a second. I did this right. <laughs> okay. Getting into the uh, uh, yes. the screener thing, which, by the way, Mike wanted to talk about. Now he's making fun of us. No, no, he you can talk about that. Here's the thing. This is today's delivery. I got this in the mail today. Uh, this is a screener package. I know that because I can see them peeking out at me through the little hole here. I don't know what's in here. I don't even know what studio this came from. I just opened it. I saw it. I thought, I'm going to save this for the show. I will let everyone share in my moment. <laughs> so here is my free screener moment. Let's see where this came from. Wouldn't it be funny if they didn't come out? If I couldn't get them out? Oh. It looks like Focus. Kids are all right. Oh! All right. All good, Somewhere, which I've already seen, the Sofia Coppola film that won the Venice Film Festival. George Clooney and the American, a film which I've also already seen, liked very much. Nobody else seemed to like it. They marketed it like the uh, the Bourne I, Ultimatum. I thought there were going to be like gifts in here. Uh, Just it's movies. kind of a funny story. One of my favorite films of the year. Terrific. Absolutely terrific. Movie? Ben Stiller is Greenberg and the movie about Mark's life. Babies. <laughs> so, hey. we are... Uh, now, how many of those are you going to bring to Amoeba to trade in? Uh, none of these. Well, none. Th th well, no, no, th no. <laughs> these are these are screeners. Oh, the screeners. Uh, screener. um, uh, the uh, the stores will not uh, buy back screeners. All right. No. So here's the thing, Wade. The, these get no. These are all these are all good films. So uh, is, uh, Focus had a good year. Now that I'm looking at this, they right, really did. All right. First of all, shut up. It's second kind of, of all, a funny story is so good. Second of all, so now good. have you seen it? Have you seen uh, it? No. Kind of a funny story? Uh, Mike just made fun of us for not moving it along. Yeah, Move yeah, it along. Jesus Christ. Okay. So we will get these sorts of these sorts of packages pretty much every day for the next twenty days. Okay. Okay. Yeah, once Thanksgiving's now, out of the way, it's nonstop. Now, Wade, uh, this show is a personal high point for me. I'll tell you why. Why? Because Paul F. Tompkins is on the show! Paul F. Tompkins! Yeah. Here's, Absolutely. Here's the thing. Here's the thing with Paul F. Tompkins. Paul F. Tompkins does a show at Largo called the Paul F. Tompkins Show. And I'm telling you, How did you it is... How that title? I don't know. I don't know. You got to change his we'll name. find out soon. Exactly. He, uh, it is pretty much the best two hours of live comedy variety in the city. That's saying a lot. Now, really, that of course, is the show is five hours long, but you take away the three no. hours that don't work, and you got the two that are great. No. Now, I've seen, uh, I've seen the Paul F. Tompkins Show. Now, Paul doesn't even know this. I've seen the Paul F. Tompkins Show. I tried to count. And I don't mean tried to count like I couldn't count, but I tried to count how many times I've seen the show. I would say between six to eight. Now, Mike wow. has seen the show, Paul F. Tompkins Show, how many? Since, well, when it, the first, like, three years, I think I went to every single show. Then Paul took a break, went to New York or something, which, you know, we all cried. And then at that point, Naked Trucker Show was gone, too, so it was horrible. That was the dark, dark times of Largo. Wow. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know, 50? So the Paul F. Tompkins oh, show is unbelievably great. Uh, Paul has a, a Tangled, the new Disney film, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about later. He's in that. And he's got a podcast he wants to talk about. So Paul F. Tompkins, I love the fact that he's on, so we're very excited awesome. about that. It'll be later. Great show. Also, by the way, before we start this weekend in movies, I've been told on this piece of paper that Mike generates before the show, like us on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now it's time for this weekend in movies. Let's do it. That wasn't desperate at all. <laughs> <laughs> mm.
You can talk. Your mics are on. You can keep oh. talking. Oh, oh, fantastic. All right, wait. There's a there's there's a movie coming out on Friday. <laughs> there is. A, well, there are several movies coming out on Friday. Did you have one in mind? Uh, yes. I was thinking we should talk about the Harry Potter. Oh. Kids love the Woo! Harry Potter. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part One. Every right now, how many people are turning away because they're going at midnight and don't want to know things? No, we're not going to. You're watching live. We're not, we're not going to spill okay. anything. There's right. probably 75 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes at this point. Right. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, the film's already opened overseas. I know. So it's not like nobody's seen this the film. This really is not selling yourselves as we're the experts who have it first. Well, but we're not. This, we case, can't fool it. In this case, it's, it's kind of hard. All right. <laughs> okay. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, part one. This is part one of part seven, as our, uh, our good friend Corey over here was uh, making fun of earlier in the show, uh, just before we did the show. Here's the thing. Um, if, you, if you love the books, you, you, you probably sat around eagerly waiting for this. I have seen all of these movies. I don't remember anything about any of the preceding movies. And I have to. Re it, it, it's usually by halfway through each film that I remember what came back in the previous film. So it takes me a little while to get up to speed. But that being said, we're starting to wrap things up. And this movie basically consists of Ron and Harry and Hermione on the run from Voldemort. They've disbanded the school. Everything's in chaos and evil is starting to reign and they've infiltrated the Ministry of Magic, etc., etc. And so they're on the run and they're Death Eaters chasing them everywhere. We've got a little clip. No, wait. There no? Was, we were going to show something before the clip. Oh, were we? Yeah, you were going to talk before wait, the Mark, Mark wanted to see before the clip. Oh, the this is pre meeting. Oh. Pre show now, meeting. Okay, hang on. Here's, oh. hang on. Here's, so a the clip? here's the situation. Yes. When you get these clips from the studio, Wade, yes. all sorts of things you got to sign, you got you to oh, so get emails, disclaimers, rights Disclaim. and clearances, right? So, with the Warner Brothers stuff, it wasn't just a rights and clearance, it, yeah. it was this enormous document that got sent to Corey and Mike. And we had no idea it would be this gigantic. And we wanted to show it to you to let you know what it is that we endure so that you get the best clips out there. So the clip before the clip. This is a clip before the clip. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is not a joke. No, this is Corey. Yeah, this is the real deal. Corey got, he had to accept this. So now all you should be reading this at home. Please accept this so we can show you the clip afterwards. Okay. <laughs> So normally what happens is, now the studios want you to play the clips yes. because it promotes their film. Uh, I, I think I understand what this is about. I think Warner Brothers has, you know, look, they've spent who knows how many hundreds of millions just making and marketing this film. The last thing they want to see are clips from their movie showing up on YouTube mashups. So I think that's what this is meant to do, is, to, is to, so they can control the publicity, control the exposure in a very, very tight way. And that, I, don't, I don't blame them for that. And that being said, here's a clip from their movie. Now here's the clip. So where do we go from here? Leaky cauldron. It's too dangerous. If Voldemort really has taken over the Ministry, then none of the old places are safe. Everyone from the wedding will have gone underground, into hiding. Got my rucksack with all my things. I've left it at the burrow. You're joking? I've had all the essentials packed for days, just in case. By the way, these jeans, not my favorite. Okay, now Mark doesn't really know what Death Eaters or Horcruxes or any of that is. I, I sort of remembered about half an hour into the movie and eventually piece it together. So, so, but that being said, I gotta say, I, I didn't dislike the film. Some of the Harry Potter films I have found excruciatingly boring. Some of them I thought were okay. The first one I thoroughly hated. This one I actually kind of liked. And even though it's very much biding its time, you feel like it's just sort of stitching events together so we can eventually get to the climax that we all know is gonna happen, which is the big, the big uh, confrontation between Harry and Voldemort. Um, I, I actually think that David Yates, who directed the previous film and this one, and who's doing the very the last one, part two of uh, the Deathly Hallows, um, he comes from British television, like so many other great directors, including Tom Hooper, who we're going to talk about later, who did the King's Speech. 
but he's a, he's a, he's really really developing into a very very cinematic director. His his look, his uh, his style, his camera movement, his compositions, uh, the art direction by Stuart Craig, who's one of the all time greats. It just feels like a big cinematic movie. And even if the story doesn't always really kind of live up to the 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 trappings, I thought the movie was was engaging, and I thought it was just beautifully done. You know, it, it, it's it's one of the first films where they really went outside of uh, the, the castle and the school and yeah. whatever, and you get these, and it's almost like they're really trying to take advantage of that because you get these enormous right. vistas, Absolutely. and they're all really, really well I, shot. Which is really cinematic. I mean, I, I enjoyed that. And, the, you know, the fact that big chunks of the movie consist of Harry and Hermione in a tent in the woods, is a, it, it, it gets a little long in the tooth at those points, especially when, you know, Hermione drills a hole in Harry's leg and then puts the millstone through it. And No, that's Antichrist. That's the Lars von Trier's film Antichrist <laughs> with oh, Willem Dafoe. Am I getting them mixed up? It was like NC-17. I, I've Remember seen that? so many movies this is year. Is that right? I, I, they just kind of blur together. To and there's like eight point. more on the floor right here. Yeah. So okay, um, my thing with the movie is that uh, I thought, you know what? I think Harry Potter fans might be bored. I mean, it's very poorly paced. It lurches along in really slow fashion and then it kind of goes true. and then it kind of goes half speed and then stops again because for this feels, long it feels like they intentionally wanted to take that last book and drag it out to two movies. They don't want to see a good thing stop. It's been a cash cow for a good decade and they don't want to see it stop. They want it to keep going. So they're they're they, they well let's let's see if we can squeeze one more movie and another half a well, billion dollars out of it. But the so problem it really feels like they they're stretching it. But, I agree with that. But the problem is that you know the movie's two and a half hours, so instead all of two and a half hours, yeah. So instead of giving us more character, yeah, they give us more plot and stuff for them to walk around and do and find. But compare well, that to the first film, which really had no plot. It was just like uh, here's Harry's first year at school, and the, you know that that was really really long in the tooth. And, so and this also is probably one of the uh, it's the, pretty much the darkest episode. They're getting darker, as they should, because there's more and more evil. And Ray Fiennes as Voldemort is just great casting. Yeah. And, you know, at this point, is there any British actor or actress who has not appeared in one of these films? This, th th this, feels, honestly, this movie... It feels like the entire Royal Shakespeare Company has at least cameoed in one of these films. Do you remember when they did The Godfather 3 and, every, and had, there not, had and, not been a Godfather film for 20 know, years, and every Italian actor in the world every single one. wanted to be in The Godfather yeah. 3, and in yeah. the end they wound up casting Andy Garcia. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> How'd that happen? So, but here in Harry Potter, you got Brendan Gleeson, Imelda Staunton, Bill Nye. Oh, on you got Richard, Peter Richard, Mullen. Peter Richard, Mullen's in this. I know Richard Griffiths for crying I out loud, who's just still alive. I think he's staying alive just to keep making these movies. <laughs> exactly. I saw him on stage, you know, and I, we thought he was going to have a heart attack on stage. I don't know. I don't know what keeps him going. That there, guy's like 900 pounds. <laughs> It's incredible. You know, the, 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 the only part of the film that didn't like kind of bore me is there's a very clever, a really interesting animated interlude where they explain what the Deathly Hallows That's are. That's a terrific segment. Which That's is a really terrific good. terrific segment. Yeah. That's kind of my favorite, yeah. my favorite three minutes of the film. It, it's, it's, it might be my favorite three minutes of any Harry Potter film. And that, <laughs> that could yeah, be really. true, actually. I, I'm pretty serious. So I know there's a lot of people are lining up at midnight to go, th go see this thing. I think that everybody will be satisfied because they get to see their favorite characters again, and there, there's a bit of a budding romance between two of the characters, which yeah. I think is, was, uh, was a little uh, kind of a little half-ass, if you ask me, uh, the way it was portrayed. Because again, you got two and a half hours to build up this relationship, and they don't really spend much time doing it. Look, there have been better Harry Potter movies, and there have been worse Harry Potter movies, and this feels a little bit like not. I'm not comparing uh, comparing it to The Empire Strikes Back, but it feels it feels like a middle film. Right? It does. It does it feel like, like a middle, middle film. film. Yes. So don't expect any kind of closure here. This is really leading you to next summer. That's right. Yeah. Um, so that is Harry Potter. That I think Harry I think Potter. we did okay with that. We didn't hate it. We kind of hated it. No, it's good. I, it's, I, I give it a thumbs I, up. I just thought it was kind of boring. Sure, absolutely. So uh, <laughs> there you go. I don't know where that leaves us. <laughs> I don't know where that leaves us either. With each other, I don't and I'm really confused. <laughs> you know what? It's I'm now it's watching fine. on YouTube already. You guys exactly. suck. It's which is fine. I'm already predicting it's, that. You know what? Parts of it are kind of boring. But parts of it are really good, and at the end, you'll be fine with it because you're going to want to want to see the next film anyway. That's pretty much sums it up. Yeah. All right. Next is uh, the next three days. Which yeah, I didn't see. Which you didn't see. I saw the next three days. <laughs> so wait, what did you think of the next three days? I loved it. Why don't you go ahead and tap dance that one? All right. <laughs> All right. In the, in the next three days, Russell Crowe plays a this Prius driving community college teacher whose wife is in jail for murdering her boss. So with all legal appeals exhausted, Crowe decides he's going to have he's going to do the only thing left to him. He's going to break her out of jail. Let's go to a clip.
what? Shut up. I don't care what you say or how you say it. I don't believe you did it. And I never will. I know who you are. And I promise you, this will not be your life. So half the film is Russell Crowe arranging this complicated escape plot so he can go into the prison and get his wife out. And what happens is, is that uh, Crowe starts to meet sort of the neighborhood lowlifes because he needs to get a passport, needs to get all the time. You don't really know what the plot, what his plot is. He sort of, you sort of take it on faith that he's kind of going down and down deeper into the rabbit hole in order to meet these lowlifes and get the stuff that he needs in order to break his wife out. And there's actually a very weird cameo by Liam Neeson who plays his cat burglar who is dressed like a cat burglar, and he knows everything there is to know about breaking out of prisons because he broke out of prison seven times. So he's like that narrative convenience that writer-director Paul Haggis needs in order to make sure that Russell Crowe has downloaded everything he needs to know to get her out of prison. Uh, so what happens is, is that he finally sort of makes this prison break, and what Paul Haggis does here, which I didn't really like, Paul Haggis is a clever man, but a lot of his movies are, are sort of sidetracked and derailed by his lofty aspirations. Paul Haggis, as you know, uh, wrote and directed Crash, which I thought was an insufferable liberal message movie, and I didn't like it at all. I loved it. You loved Crash. I loved Crash, favorite film of that year. Then he did In the Valley of Ella, which is sort of an Iraq yeah. war film, which was again another film about, you know, racism and all, and, and, and the, that final shot of In the Valley of Ella, where the, yeah. where the flag goes up the flagpole, the yeah, American flag, you know. didn't like that. That was terrible too. And here he wants you to think that as Russell Crowe meets these people and gets deeper and deeper into this plan to break his wife out of prison, he's becoming somebody his wife maybe wouldn't love anymore. And that's what Paul Haggis wants you to think. You know, you know what we want? We just want an exciting story. That's all we want. We want an interesting plan that's excitingly told. It should be a tense, fun, tight genre exercise, and that's all we really wanted, but Haggis, he just can't stop himself. You know, he just can't make a fun movie. And the thing is that you, you, you get an hour, the movie's almost two hours, in fact, I think it's over two hours. Uh, you get about an hour and 15 minutes of the plotting and the planning and all this stuff, and it's just not that interesting. We're not that invested. Now, the last act, which is the escape, I don't want to say what happens, but it's the escape attempt. Uh, it's relatively exciting. It's fine. Although I have to say that Elizabeth Banks, who plays the uh, the wife, she's not really worth the effort. You know, she's not oh, that great an actress. She really can't stand up to Russell Crowe. So in the end, in, in uh, say again. I will kill you. Uh, no, <laughs> Elizabeth Banks. Uh, she's she's a cutie. I like. She's a Dory pretty a girl. Crush. And oh, you know, she's, she's a pretty girl who does good in comedies. Yes. But when you put her up next to Russell Crowe, it's a whole different situation. She sort of shrinks. She's kind of interchangeable with Rachel McAdams in a way. You who, you, who, you be quiet. <laughs> wow. <laughs> really? Big Elizabeth Banks fan over there. I mean. No, really, because they're both on magazine covers this month, because they're both in movies, you know, Rich McAdams in, uh, in Morning Glory. In Morning Glory. And honestly, you look at those two magazine covers, it's like mm, separated at birth. Is that right? Yeah, they, I, they're very, I mean, they really are kind of interchangeable in terms of the roles that they take. Um, <laughs> thank you, Corey. But, uh, no, you know, this is a remake of a French film. Uh, yes. Which, which I'm, I'm curious, not having seen it, not having seen either of them, have you seen the French film? Yes. Uh, how does this compare? Uh, French film, tighter, better. It, j just as ludicrous, but that's okay, because again, it, the French yeah. film knew what it was. Yeah. Here you give it to a guy like Paul Haggis, who always has to make this deeper... Here's the thing, Paul Haggis is a moralist. And when he tries to make a movie like this, he can't stop being a moralist. Yeah. He can't just make Taken. Right. You know, Taken with Liam Neeson, which Wade and I liked a lot. A lot. You know, he can't just make that movie. He's got to be a moralist. Yeah. And I think that that sort of stuff just bogs it down. Now, the movie is basically fine, but the thing is that it should have been a lot better. Yeah. You know, it should have just been this tight, exciting genre exercise. But well, Paul Haggis can't do that. This is the second film this season about people trying to get loved ones out of prison, the other being Hilary Swank in... Uh, in Conviction. In Conviction. And uh, I was kind of lukewarm on that, too. Yeah. Although, although Conviction does have Sam Rockwell. So the moral to this season is don't make movies about people breaking loved ones out of prison. That is true, because you know what? They'll all stink at this point. So go. that, okay, so let's let's recap. In case you're just joining us, let's recap. Harry Potter. Good. On, on long, a, long, long yes. and, and, sla and you know, lags in places, but fine. On a scale of one to ten, I give it a meh. 
Uh, I'll give it, I'll get, I'll give it a meth then. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, next three days, I think, is uh, basically fine. Just don't expect, uh, just don't, you're not going to buy what Haggis is selling. You'll just hopefully be caught up in, in, in the action. Yes. Now, next. Next is The King's Speech, which won the Audience Award at the Toronto Film Festival, the same award that uh, Slumdog Millionaire won. And it's come to the point now where films win the Audience Award at Toronto, they are instantly considered real Oscar contenders. The King's Speech was directed by Tom Hooper, who previously did The Damned United, which was very good. Mark and I both like that, which is amazing because Mark hates soccer. And uh, as well as the John Adams it's miniseries. True. And uh, he's another guy who comes out of British television, a very accomplished director. But this is easily the most Oscar caliber thing he has ever done. It, is the, it stars Colin Firth, who was a fr uh, one of the top uh, contenders for the Best Actor Award last year, as King George VI, otherwise known as Bertie, the man who would become King George VI. The thing is, he has a horrible, horrible stuttering problem. And as he is sitting there behind his brother, who is ahead of him in line for the throne, he's expected to do certain public things to try and uh, wax up his credentials, his royal credentials, but he's petrified about talking in public. Let's see a scene. As far as I see it, my husband has mechanical difficulties with his speech. All right. You want mechanics? We need to relax your jaw muscles, strengthen your tongue. And you do have a flabby tummy, so we'll need to spend some time strengthening your diaphragm. Simple mechanics. Fine. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Went up the hill. Who put her in? Little Tommy Tim. Da! Ma! And up comes your royal highness. All right, Bertie. Yes. It's actually quite good fun. So uh, that is Jeffrey Rush as the therapist, the Australian-born therapist, who, of course, becomes kind of the Henry Higgins or the miracle worker figure that gets him over the, uh, the stuttering issues. Um, those are really the two analogies to use here. This is very much kind of like Pygmalion meets the miracle worker. And that, of course, is Helena Bonham Carter as uh, the future King George VI wife, the future Queen of England. She also is in Harry Potter, a much more sinister part in Harry Potter. Um, this is a terrific film. This is a wonderful film written by David Seidler, who had written, previously written Tucker, and who has a lot personally invested in the film because he himself overcame a stuttering problem. So writing this film was very much kind of a, a, as much about his own story as about the real story of, of King George VI. Uh, this is a great film. It's a crowd pleaser. It's a top-notch film. It's well made, well written, beautifully executed in every way. And I have to say, now that the, uh, the social network has kind of peaked, uh, this really is starting to look like the front runner for Best Picture, and it was considered like that at the end of Toronto, and I think it's going to hold all the way through the Oscars. I agree. I, I like this film a lot too. Yeah. And and the, the one film you can you can compare it to also is The Queen, and mm -hmm. it's it's okay. a little easy to make that comparison because it's the same. You know, that you're talking about uh, royal family, whatnot. Yeah. But what The Queen had that this also has is it has that. It's serious, but yet it's a little, as you say, light and crowd pleasery without, without giving up any of that serious intent, that thematic intent. And that's why I think people will really, really dig it. And Jeffrey Rush is hands down, I'm telling Amazing. you this now, this is the scoop. Mark's vote, LA Film Critics Association vote, supporting my actor. number one vote supporting actor, Jeffrey Rush, done. Same here. Lock it in. Same here. I mean, he's fantastic. And Colin Support, Firth is great, too. Supporting actress, do you have one yet? Well, people are talking about Helena Bottom Carter. No. 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 Who? No. Animal Kingdom. Grandmother. That's true. That's a whole nother show. She is just... Oh! I have nightmares. Okay, you know what? That's not, that's not a callback to like 10 minutes ago. I that's know, a callback to like five weeks ago. Sorry. Didn't mean to kind of derail the show. But, but, but she's she she quite moment. good. It was a little moment. We'll be doing gone. an Oscar wrap-up show. Yeah. We'll it was a Oscar moment. Show. Now it's yeah. gone. We'll now we're back to that then. movie. That's true. Now, I, I like this movie a lot. That's and you great. know what? Hooper did a great job because you know what? The way he composes the shots where he isolates people in the corner of the frame to sort yeah. of set them apart and make them feel sort of a little bit uncomfortable is just terrific. It is very differently directed from anything he's done before. It's less naturalistic. It's a little more exaggerated, and I'm glad that it is, because the subject is about a guy who has a stuttering problem, and it's very easy to make light of that, and it's very easy to make that tedious. 
And you have to find a way to invite the audience into the world of a guy who has this particular affliction where we don't feel like we're watching a movie of the week, where we understand that there are really serious ramifications to being a royal and not being able to present yourself in a royal way. And uh, Colin Firth, hands down, is going to win Best Actor. I mean, I don't even, uh, this is a, uh, as a far gone, foregone conclusion just like it was last year with Jeff Bridges. I think there's no question. And what's great about He's it, too, away with it. what's great about it, too, is that you're talking about a time that we never even really Really considered, which is that when radio began, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, the royals had to actually be heard. Yeah. You know, they were never heard by the masses. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, radio comes in, and you've got to not only be a royal and not only lead the country, you but you, you've got to be able to be a communicator. You've got to win the public over with your voice. Well, we learned, we we discovered a lot of that in the United States as well with FDR. You know, when FDR was wheelchair bound, no one knew it because he appeared on television and in newsreels only from, you know, only his, his torso. So there was a lot of that going on in the world in the time, at the time of radio and television and newsreels and movies, where suddenly public figures had to really tailor their presentation, their appearance, their voices, how they were photographed, how they were recorded. And uh, this gets right to the root of that as well. It's sort of the beginning of the media age and, uh, and leaders of countries having to somehow figure out how they are going to modulate their lifestyle to be a part of that. I think it's fascinating. It's a great film. It, you know, it is a terrific film. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we have one more, and then we have Paul F. Tompkins uh, coming up. Paul F. Tompkins, what, what is Paul F? Paul F. is texting. Sir, be honest. He Look, what's is, he doing? He is he's a texting. communications what's he doing? maniac. He is Does, tweeting about he the show, you idiot. He has 85,000 followers, he, unlike you. He, we got nothing. We got no followers. He's got a huge we fan got, base that verified. may want to talk to him. He's on a, a communications <laughs> maniac. And he's By the way, <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10, our fan base, meh, yeah. in terms of numbers. Yeah. Paul F. off the charts. Right, so maybe he's getting in touch with those people, and you... You pointed out we're trying to make him feel at home. He is a we, you know what? We get a you big star in here, and here, that's what you do. Here, he, we, he, he is at home because we're making fun of him because that's what we do. When you're in the family, we make fun of you. He is a plugged-in communications god. <laughs> <laughs> Corey's being excommunicated from the family, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Paul, run audio. Paul F. Tompkins and running audio, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so uh, we have one more film, ladies and gentlemen. It's a Tangled. Yes. Now, Tangled is uh, the Disney spin on Rapunzel. It's pretty much their uh, their first traditional fairy tale take in almost 20 years. Almost 20 years. You know who steals this movie? The Short Thug. <laughs> there's a guy in this movie named Short Thug. Short Thug. It's steals funny. Steals the movie. And, and it's funny because there, there's a scene when Short Thug is, is, is texting. And I'm thinking, why would he text her? He just loves to text. The actor we'll loves to text. We'll get into that later. We'll get into that later. I have no idea what I'm saying. Okay, here's, here's the thing with Tangled. Uh, the movie is, ba is obviously based on Rapunzel, and uh, it is fairly... It was originally called Rapunzel. That's true. And they changed the title because they didn't think that it would market well with young boys. That is true. Obviously, we have a more misogynistic generation that of young boys. That was seriously boys. why they changed the name? Yes. Yes. It wasn't a legal thing? No, it no. It was because we now have a more misogynistic uh, generation of young boys than when we had The Little Mermaid. <laughs> or Beauty and the Beast. Or Beauty and the Beast. That's ridiculous. Okay. So, it's fairly uh, consistent with the Rapunzel story, which is Rapunzel is kidnapped as a baby and forced to live every day of her life in this tall, tall tower, and she's lorded over by this sort of evil, the evil woman who kidnapped her. She's actually the, the daughter of the king and queen, but she winds up being kidnapped, and she lives in this tall, tall tower every day of her life for 17 years, and she wants nothing more than to get out of this tower, but the evil mother, the evil stepmother, who is, of course, is very manipulative, she tries to convince Rapunzel to stay in the tower because the outside world is so big and bad. So let's take a look at a clip, and then we'll talk about it some more. Absolutely exhausting, darling. Oh, it's nothing. Then I don't know why it takes so long. <laughs> oh, darling, I'm just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mother, as you know, tomorrow is a very big day. Look in that mirror. You know what I see? I see a strong, confident, beautiful young lady. <laughs> oh, look, you're here too. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Stop taking everything so seriously. 
Later, obviously, uh, Rapunzel leaves the tower and has an adventure with this uh, rakish bandit named uh, Flynn Rider. And the two of them go off together to uh, have all sorts of cool laughs and a, a halfway decent Alan Menken score. Not my favorite Alan Menken score, but it's still okay. And uh, I like this movie a lot. You know what? I didn't expect much going in. I kind of thought it would be lame, but I walked in there. I sat down. I was swept away. I thought it was quite good. Mandy Moore, who does the voice of uh, Rapunzel, is very good, very expressive. She's not the necessarily the greatest singer in the world, and when you hear Donna Murphy, who's a classic Broadway actress, Donna Murphy plays the sort of the evil stepmother, she belts it out. She is she is yeah. fantastic. And what I liked about the movie is that it sort of it sort of straddles that line between classic Disney animation and Pixar, because here you have a movie that uh, what's gone is all that, that all that snark and all those pop mm -hmm. culture references that you really got sick of with movies like Shrek. And here is just sort of traditional Disney animation. It's a little modern, so it's it's a little modern in some of the dialogue, so it's not going to be a classic Beauty and the Beast sort of tale, but I liked it a lot. I, I liked it a lot. I think I may have liked it more than you. It, I think it's about 70% Beauty and the Beast. It's about 70% of that feel, and then the rest, I, they're marketing it much more as something like Shrek, which I think is a mistake, and I think it's really odd. Apart from changing the title, can you imagine if The Little Mermaid had been called, you know, something's fishy? It just, you know, <laughs> would that work? No. I mean, it they sounds misogynistic. It, exactly. It should have been still Rapunzel, and Rapunzel would have been more true to what this film is. It really has, uh, it's, it feels much closer to that. I'm glad they brought Alan Menken back. He's, he still hasn't recaptured that magic of when he worked with Howard Ashman. Howard Ashman is one of the great lyricists of all time, and, and his death was such a tragedy. So he's been, you know, going through a lot of different lyricists in all these different films. And I think uh, he's he's connected with a guy here whose name I don't I can't remember, but he it, it's it's a it's a better working relationship. This is good. These are the songs are good. The score is really good. Uh, I, I I understand why they decided to go 3D animation instead of just regular cell animation. I might have liked it more if it were cell animation, but even still, I thoroughly enjoyed the film and had a great time with it. That was that was the that's the interesting part where you know Disney's intention was to make a CG film that looks hand drawn. Yeah. And of course, in that case, why not? Just make it hand drawn. Exactly. You know, but I, but it, it, it looks good. It the does. the uh, the expressions are, are great. And you know what? Now we're finally in an era where you could really, you could really see Rapunzel's hair. Yeah. Every inch of it. Yeah. You know, detailed, and it looks great. And you know what? And there's some terrific. And the way they use the hair, it's funny because. Once they get farther into the story, you start to wonder, you know, how are they going to animate this hair more? They wind up getting out of that yeah. in a clever way, where Very they sort of tie her hair up in a bow because they can't take it anymore. They had, to, they had to animate 70 feet of hair for an hour and a half. But this is a really terrific script. i, I got to say that. It is, a, it is a very sharp script. It does what Beauty and the Beast did very well, which is taking a fairy tale, the sum total of which you can really recount to somebody in about two minutes. I mean, the story of Beauty and the Beast and the story of Rapunzel take no time to tell the classic fairy tale details up. So how do you take that little threadbare story and inflate it to something 90 minutes in length without it feeling like you're just blowing a lot of air into a very simple story? Well, you have to add a lot of details and complications. You have to change a few things. And there you run the risk of, of kind of betraying the spirit of the original story, which has happened on many occasions. But in Beauty and the Beast and here, I think they were very, very, very cool, very faithful to the, the original material. They were very careful in how they uh, made changes. And uh, I think they pulled off a, a wonderful film for the holidays. Right, but it, but it's still, even though that's right, it's still fun. I mean, oh, it's a you lot know, of fun. You know, Beauty and the Beast and Lion King, obviously they're, they're classics, yeah. but they're not, quote unquote, these, this rollicking good time. I think that Tangle yeah, tries to be more of that rollicking good time. It, a little bit. So I think you sort of lose some of the, 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 the that classic feeling that you got from these other films. True. You know, but that being said, it's still a terrific film. I agree. So uh, we were pleasantly surprised. Very. By Tangled. Uh, all right, so there you go. Wait, so they, th those are the four films. We have Harry Potter, Next Three Days, King's Speech, and Tangled. Uh, my pick, King's Speech. Go. Your pick. Oh, yeah, easy. King's Speech, for sure. There you go. Yeah. So that is uh, This Weekend in Movies. There you have it. <laughs> Corey was just momentarily channeling Kool-Aid. What was that, Corey? What'd you say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel like Kool-Aid's going to come busting through the door at any moment. All right, speaking of people busting through the door, now wait, it's been a big week oh, it's in huge news. Week. It's huge week in news. Too many news stories to keep track of. And when it comes to news, you don't want to hear from some of these entertainment tonight, the extra, no, these e-people. They're all lame. It. Who do you want to hear your news from? Chad Vader. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, Chad. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hey. Oh, oh, Chad, my Chad. <laughs> That's me, baby. <laughs> What's happening down at the market? Oh, I'm very excited to be on the show today with Paul F. Tompkins. Oh, boy. <laughs> Who isn't? Paul F. Tompkins, give him a hand. Come on. Love the mustache, Paul. Don't don't <laughs> shave it. Would you ever consider maybe growing a mustache like on the helmet? You just sort of put up. Can, can, could you do that? Like a like a like a glue on one? No, like an actual mustache. I'm not sure if you actually are made of made of metal or whether that's like actually a helmet. I, I'm helmet. not made of metal, Mark. What are you talking about? <laughs> Get it together. <laughs> All right, what's in the news? Oh, there's lots of news today. <laughs> news item number one: Amazon Studios, an offshoot of Amazon.com is looking to make commercial motion based on scripts and movies submitted by budding screenwriters and filmmakers. Filmmakers can upload their movies or scripts to the Amazon Studios website. The best part about the whole thing is that if you finance your movie with an Amazon.com rewards visa card, you can save $40 on your total budget cost. <laughs> so like a million dollar movie would only cost like $900,999.960. You understand what I'm saying? Plus, they offer free Super Saver post-production. Sounds like a good deal to me. All right, all right, Wade, okay. Um, Wade, heaven help us. I am going to go out on the world's shortest limb and say that Amazon Studios will fail and they will not make one film. Of course it'll fail. Of course it'll fail. Look, Project Greenlight delivered all of those classics, like... Um, Stolen Summer. By the way, pro may, may I say something? <laughs> Project Greenlight, the guy who won Project Greenlight, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Pete Jones, I was his boss on The Roseanne Show. That's great. What's, I what's, what's his next uh, film? By the way, I'm going to smite you, Wade Major, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something what Pete Jones is doing next. Pete Jones, he, he's, he's gonna, I'm going to blow his mind. <laughs> Pete Jones just wrote the new uh, Fairly Brothers film. Oh, oh. well. What have you written? Give what him, have you written? Give him an Some Oscar. blank checks? What have you written in the last two years? Oscar. <laughs> the guy got paid to write a movie. What have you done? Zero. The point, the point being. Yes. If it wasn't for being. Project Greenlight, Pete Jones wouldn't be. He'd be doing what we're doing, which is sitting in a chair talking to people. The, the point being, the point being, the point being. I don't even know what that meant. This is what happens thanks to Dancing with the Stars and American Idol. Now suddenly the public is being invited to vote on everything. There were at least a dozen websites a few years ago where you pay a fee and you send in your screenplay and people evaluate it. The end will be a contest and all these Hollywood bigwigs will judge your screenplay and your movie will get made. And nothing came of that. Nothing came of it because this is not how movies get made. The public gets to vote with their dollars once the movie is made. But letting the public vote on what should get made, uh, I'm going to paraphrase Steve Jobs paraphrasing Henry Ford. If I, had let the, if I had listened to the public what the public wanted, I'd be making a better horse. Y the public doesn't know what they want, especially when movies are concerned. Do you think the public would ever have voted f to, to have, <coughs> say, you know, Sunset Boulevard be a movie? No. If they had read the script, they but wouldn't know what to make of it. That's not happening today. That's it's not. That's not gonna what they're I mean, doing is they're asking people to vote on what should be get made. What I'm saying is, would you That's rather have crazy. the public or the executive who's retreading every remake over and over again, and the same and the same romantic comedy over and over again? There hasn't been anything good or funny in That's in like decades. asking me to choose between Satan and Beelzebub. Yeah. All right. And in that case, I'm going to go with Satan. So you're going you're gonna to go with the Satan that you know. I'm going with the Satan I know. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I just, I, I am opposed to anything that lets morons have hope. So I, just can't, I can't get behind this. So you just call me a moron? Not you, no. All, all, the, goofballs, all the goofballs out there who, are, who, who have this script about that time that they and their fraternity brothers went to Tijuana and got drunk and they're thinking, oh, it's going to be such a hot movie. But we also know that the, the movies sometimes are really well written and then once they go through the whole system, that's usually when they get killed. So even if there is a good movie out there, it's still the, Warner Brothers back, it's still, and somebody's yeah. still going to chop it down. And yeah, it's still this is a this is a gimmick, and it's just a way of for Amazon to generate you know uh, traffic on their websites, nothing more, nothing less. So it's not you know Warner Brothers still has a big say in this. And Chad's getting bored. What is Chad doing? I don't know. He's shadow boxing. <laughs> Ch you know, we like to think that Chad is sticking it to the man. Yeah. The man who would create Chad, their own Chad studio for no reason. <laughs> All right, Chad, uh, you're back in the game. What else you got for us? Warner Brothers has reached out to Robert Zemeckis to remake The Wizard of Oz. 
remakes like this have historically been a great idea. And when I say great, you can imagine me making finger quotes. It probably would have been easier for me to just make finger quotes, but anyway, I'm digressing. Zemeckis has apparently turned down the project, instead deciding to focus on a CG remake of Yellow Submarine, which sounds simply awful. I'm sure these bozos will take grossly beloved movies and turn them into CGI crap fests. My message to Warner Brothers and Zemeckis is, great idea, guys, keep it up. And when I say great idea, you can imagine me making the obscene gesture of your choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole thing with Zemeckis is that he's fallen in love with mocap. The oh, last couple of films he's done has been mocap films, and I, I, I don't get why he's fallen in love with that. I, I, Robert Zemeckis is, it's funny because when he did Cast Away, I thought, well, it's not a great film, but it's at least the guy who made Forrest Gump, you know, he, there's been a progression here. He's trying to make a more serious film, he's going in a more artsy direction, he's going in a more human direction, and then he just completely went off the rails. That was his last live-action film, so live you know, it was film. cast away. He's gone completely off the rails, and everything's mocap and CGI, and it's just horrible. Well, because the thing is, is that what what happens is when filmmakers fall in love with toys yeah. like that, it's not about the storytelling; it's about the toys. At some point, Robert Zemeckis is going to be 75 years old, and he's going to want to make a real movie again, and then maybe you know I'll. Will be rewarded with something again, but uh, right I guess now he's just you know lost. What? He's lost in the wilderness. Well, the one smart thing he did was not remake Wizard of Oz. I mean, who the hell needs that? Well, oh yeah, thank goodness we're gonna get a remake of uh, Yellow Submarine. Yeah, I enjoyed reading the story. It's like he's not gonna do Wizard of Oz. Oh good, he's gonna do Yellow Submarine and CGI. What? <laughs> instead, <laughs> of, <laughs> instead of doing one thing that sucks, he'll do another thing yeah. that sucks. That was his choice. They're both terrible <laughs> ideas. They really are. All right, Chad. What else she got for us? The Green Lantern movie trailer is available to watch, and it looks pretty awesome. Let's check it out. Sorry, I gotta run. Make yourself at home, okay? There's, uh, water in the tap. Hal, you're late. This test today, it's important. I'm gonna make you look good up there, don't worry. Now let's get these pants off and fly some planes. When I'm flying, it feels like anything is possible. It's like no matter how bad things get, there's something good out there just over the horizon. And Chad, what do you think of that? Yeah. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the, movie st- <laughs> Ooh. the movie stars Pretty Boy Ryan Reynolds and Creepy Boy Peter Sarsgaard. <laughs> oh, Peter Sarsgaard creeps me out. He's got those creepy eyes, man. 
Ooh. Give me the willies. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a good movie. In preparation for the release of Green Lantern, I've always, I've already started removing everything yellow from my house. <laughs> Sorry, bananas, you're out of here. Unfortunately, this also means I no longer have a couch. <laughs> Can I, let me just say, Wade, I'm, 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 I'm going to, uh, I'm going to say something very controversial. And when I say controversial, I mean no one will care. Okay. Green Lantern, not sold. See, I am, and I and I am. Although well, Martin Campbell is a talented director, that Very guy talented is a talented director. director. I'll give you that. He's made some great Bond films, and uh, even No Escape. Did you ever see No Escape with yeah. Leota? That's a terrific film. It is. That's a really surprisingly good film. Uh, Martin Campbell makes intelligent action movies. I have all the faith in the world, regardless of the script. The script is ultimately the determinant here, but um, I have faith in him. And here's the thing: I was always that DC nerd. I was the guy that all the Marvel comic people picked on because I like DC. Marvel. Okay? No, DC, right here. Uh, Green Lantern, always on board. Love Green Lantern. One of my favorite DC uh, heroes. I, uh, I think it's a, I'm thrilled that they're making it into a movie. Ryan Reynolds is the right guy, even though he's also playing Deadpool in the Deadpool movie, which is a Marvel hero. And like Chris Evans is doing not only the Fantastic Four films, but Captain America. we got to stop doubling up here. That's a, that's a little so weird. So Ryan Reynolds is playing a DC hero and a Marvel hero. Yeah. That's, it, it, that's like crossing the streams. You can't do that. No, I know. It's right? against the law. I know. Bad. It would be it bad. Would be bad. <laughs> it would be very bad. <laughs> All right, Chad. So uh, there you go, Chad. Hey, Chad, I hope, things, I hope things are great down at the Empire Market. Things are awesome. Hey, check out, uh, there's a Chad, new Chad Vader DVD available. Uh, Chad Vader Season 3 DVD. Check it out. BlameSociety.net. Sweet. BlameSociety.net. Oh, check it out. There's Chad Vader, everybody. BlameSociety.net. Thank you. Thank you. Green Thank Lantern. You. <laughs> this is green. Check this out. This is green. <laughs> well, at least you know Chad's not colorblind. We learned that today. Yes, it is green. All right, now wait. Here's the situation. We've done the movies. We've done the Chad. Yes, we have. The reason why I'm here tonight is not to talk about the movies or see you. We're going to see you all the time. It's because of Paul F. Tompkins. Now, Paul F. Tompkins is like the funniest guy on the planet. I've seen the Paul F. Tompkins show at Largo like six to eight times. Mike's seen it a thousand times. This guy's it hilarious. It doesn't really sound like a big six number. Three, it's unbelievable. It six to really, eight times. It doesn't really sound He like only does it every <laughs> ten years. He does Come it on. every month for six years, I think, I want to say. Not probably. six years. Wait, wait, don't. No, he'll I, talk about it when right, he'll talk. Six to eight times doesn't sound like a lot. What? Oh, look, what would what, I say? See, how huh? many times you see Naked Trucker show? Six to eight times. <laughs> I see everything six to eight times. I guess it is a lot. My, That's I a lot for me. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm seeing movies all the time. That's it's unbelievable. True. That is true. All right. Here's yes. the thing. Now, uh, now we want to show you. Uh, this thing called Sketch of the Dead. Now, Sketch of the Dead was this really funny thing that actually Mike Rodman did. Mike Rodman, Sketch of the Dead, it was with Paul F. Tompkins. And so let's Ben see, Acker. And Ben Acker. All right. And I've it. seen his show five to seven times. Oh. No, I, I think you've seen... I was working a lot at yeah. the time, and I could only ben see Acker it five to seven good. times. So let's, do, so let's check out Sketch of the Dead, and then we'll bring out Paul F. Okay, the door is secure. Right. So are the windows. I think we're gonna be okay till morning. Do you wanna sleep the first shift? Yeah, I can do that. But listen, Paul, I gotta run something by you. Uh, if those zombies do get in here, if they get past the barricade, I need you to promise they me. They won't, they won't, okay? No. We're, we're, we're gonna make it through this. I know, but if we don't make it through, and if I don't make it through, then no, I need you No, listen, man, listen, man. We're gonna make it through, You okay? listen to me? If the zombies get in here and they bite me, and I start turning into one of those brain eating monsters, then I want you to promise me. All right, I'll do it, okay? I'll do it. If you get bitten, I will put a bullet in your brain before you can turn uh, into one of those no, monsters. No, 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 no. That is not what I want you to promise me. I want you to promise me the opposite, that you will not shoot me. What? I want you to promise me that you will not, under any circumstances, shoot me ever. You're saying you want to turn into one of those zombies? No, I don't want to become a zombie. Who wants to become a zombie? That's pigeon logic. If, hypothetically, one of the zombies were to bite me, like on my arm or something, then I, I, I would get the zombie juice in and my brain would, it wouldn't matter. It would turn to mush. I might, could, I might, it's like my brain's on a vacation. It's taking a vacation from me and I don't know anything. And that's fine, I don't care about anything. But if you shoot me, then I am dead. And I do not want that, it terrifies me. 
So please, whatever you do, just don't shoot me. So, okay, I won't, I won't shoot you. Whoa! Not giving it all Whoa. away! Boy, oh boy! Gotta say something for Adam.com, that's oh. where you can see it! I've already seen that and I want to go to Adam.com and see the rest <laughs> of it. <laughs> Paul and Tompkins, everybody, come on! Oh, yeah. Yeah, if if there was a bandwagon in the middle of this room, I would be on it yes. when it comes to Paul F. I think that's just because of the, the space limitations, right? <laughs> exactly. I think we'd all be on that bandwagon. Now, now, Paul. Yes. Seriously, I don't know if you've seen Tangled, but this this short thug in Tangled st steals the movie. Wait, you... I, I I have something to tell you. What what is it? I don't obviously you didn't sit through the credits. I played that short thug. No. Yes. I did some voice acting. Uh, I did. <laughs> how many lines? I think I had five lines. I did all of them. Um, yeah, I went to the. Uh, I, I a guy named uh, one, one of the directors, Nathan uh, uh, Greeno. Um, he he's a, a guy who comes to my Largo show regularly and uh, asked me if I would be willing to do a voice in that. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it was one day's work going in there and just kind right. of, like, I, I was there for an hour and just did, you know, a bunch of different reads on everything. And, and then uh, my wife and I just went to the premiere the other night, and uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this it's thing. It's like, yeah, it really blew me away. Yeah, it's yeah. terrific. Yeah. I mean, and we had no idea that, I mean, <laughs> we're, you know, talking, just before the movie, we're talking about the show. It's like, yeah, Paul Epstein, you know, get it coming. And then we watch the movie, and the credits run, and your name goes up and the two of us did one of those what moments <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was because great. you know the you know the animated films obviously there's such lead time to it i mean when did you record the voice it must have been a, a year and a half ago i swear it did not feel like that long but um but i guess it was i have no you know it's it's a, a, a the the los angeles disease is that you lose all concept of time mm -hmm. um because there are no seasons so uh <laughs> that was either i either recorded that two weeks ago or five years ago <laughs> <laughs> but i could not tell you for sure uh, so you go in there, they, they give you the lines, do they allow you to uh, ad-lib? It's a small part, so maybe they do, maybe they don't. Uh, a little bit. I actually, I, I, I contributed a joke to the, uh, a visual joke to the film, um, where there's a scene where uh, my, <laughs> my character um, <laughs> is, uh, is behind a door, someone's trying to get access to the door, and a little slot in the door slides open, and, and I ask for the password, and... Uh, uh, the guy says something, and then I say, "No, that's not the password." Blah blah. blah. So the, uh, I contributed the idea that uh, between each exchange, I would close the little slot again, <laughs> and, uh, which they had not been planning on doing. But I was very happy to see that. That's in the great. Film. Yeah. Now, now what? Yeah. Now, did they show you what your character would look like? Did they show it? Yes, on paper? they showed me a little drawing, and there were little figurines of everybody, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> I was very excited. But there's no short thug action figure. Not yet. <laughs> Is there a short thug spinoff? <laughs> <laughs> From your lips to God's ears. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> they are. It's funny because it's it's uh there's as you as you know there's very few parts in this movie. There's yeah. there's three main parts. Yeah. And then everybody else has like a couple lines. So guys like Jeffrey Tambor, uh, he has about as many lines as I have. But he's Jeffrey Tambor, not me. You know. So uh, even well even the the, the two brothers. Mm-hmm. Are, I mean, they're a big part in the movie, but there aren't that many lines. No, 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 no. It's yeah. it's it's quite something. Yeah. But that's what I liked about the movie. Not to digress too much into the movie, but I, what I liked about it is that they spent time with the with the main characters. They spent yeah. time with them. Yeah. They were on this adventure. They stayed on the adventure. You got to know them, and that I found that uh, I found that kind of hardening hardening that they would do that. It didn't attack you with all those pop culture references that so many of those films have done. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Well, that's my problem with. Animated films like that, um, and I won't name any specific series of animated films, but the idea that, yeah, we'll throw in uh, jokes like that for the parents, you know, yeah. who have to be there. And I feel like, why don't you just make the movie good? Yeah. And then the parents will be happy, too. Yeah. It's not like the kids need to, you know, those stupid kids, they'll just watch anything, <laughs> and then the parents are stuck there. It's like, well, if you make your movie better, then you won't have to worry about the parents being miserable. And, and, and also, all those pop culture references, they may not work when you see it on DVD exactly. three years, four years, five years Or when the movie finally comes out, you know, <laughs> exactly. from, you know, from year to year. It's like, who was that again? <laughs> who was that Sarah Palin? I forgot about her. I forgot about her. I don't know who that Sarah Palin was. Have My you, God. Have you watched Aladdin again lately? I, nothing makes sense in that movie. Or, there's like an Arsenio reference Hall, in yeah, there. Yeah, there's an Arsenio Hall reference in there. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's just dreadful. So uh, I, I want to talk about, once he stops laughing, what I want to do is... Done. Done. <laughs> Welcome back to Charlie Rose. 
I want to, uh, I, want to I just want to talk about the comedy. Now, mm -hmm. when you came to L.A. from... Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, did you come to be a comic or did... Whoa, Philly in the house. Uh, by, by the way, Philly fan? I'm not a sports guy at all. Oh, I'm whoa, sorry. Whoa, interesting. Why yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, not into it? Yeah. <laughs> I, nobody's ever asked me why I don't like sports. It just seems um, weird for like a guy to not like sports. Oh, I have a disease. <laughs> I bet you're sorry you asked now. <laughs> oh, I've tried to like sports, but it's my biology. Oh, I've tried all kinds of shots there's and pills. There's, 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 there's experimental <laughs> treatments now. It's like That's dialysis. Right. You go in yeah, there and they yeah, drain exactly. your blood and replace with blood that likes oh, sports. Yeah, exactly. And then exactly. So did you come to L.A.? For comedy, to I, I came to uh, L.A. seeking my fame and fortune in the uh, performing arts. I, I I'd done stand up for Philly for eight years, um, and I started right after uh, I graduated high school. And and the there was like a comedy boom that was happening at the time that I started. So there was a ton of work, and then that boom stopped happening, and then it was a bust. And then um, I realized if I really want to if I really want to go for this, I got to go for it. And, and I moved out to L.A. and um, and then eventually started uh, working in television and film. And, yeah. You know, I used to like jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Look, some people used yeah. to like not knowing the truth about things. <laughs> but uh, I am a truth teller, and I yeah. shed the light uh, that needs to be shed on certain yeah. things like it's jazz music. Fault. Yeah, it's your fault. <laughs> I hate it now. It's all right. So, but like when it comes to when it comes to comedy and writing, is it just is it is it a sit down and write process? Is it a thing where you just you think of something, jot it down, and yeah, I I try to I try to keep track of funny ideas as they come to me. That whole like sitting down and writing, like it's just oh, I'm just going to be funny for an hour by myself, you know, at this table. That just seems impossible to me. That's when you're really like looking around, like what's funny about tables? What's funny about carpet? Um, what? What uh, light fixture jokes can I make? You know, that's that's where I would be going. Some people, that's their discipline and they're able to do it, but I still feel like they're lying a little bit. Like, you have to start with something. You have to bring some ideas to that blank page. You can't just sit down and say, uh, what, is a, what is a funny thing to write about? And then all of a sudden be writing. I just, it's a lie. <laughs> and it's also... It's not a it's not a job like that. You know, it's it's a it's 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 a thing that's built around um, inspiration. And I think anytime you are going to say from uh, from three to four today, that's when I'm going to have inspiration. I think you're you're asking for trouble. You know, it's it's one of those things that if you're a writer of any kind, you're you're sort of thinking about it all the time. Yeah. You know, so for me, when my when the writing happens, it's like if I have a set to do. Uh, that that day is when I will I will organize my my thoughts and my ideas and everything. But I will have already been thinking about this stuff, you know. But I have to put it. I have to make bullet points or make a sort of skeleton of uh, of the ideas that I'm talking about, and then uh, work it out on stage. But but do you find that there are th certain things that put you in a in a creative frame of mind? Triggers that that sort of help you focus that uh, that remove the distractions? No. There is no. <laughs> nothing that removes the distractions, unfortunately. And I think that is also the, the, the dirty secret of writing is so much of it is procrastination. So much <laughs> of it is looking online, watching TV, whatever. Um, and I find that that's where that's actually where a lot of inspiration ends up happening, because now that you're not you're not. Um, you're taking the pressure off of yourself. Sooner or later, your mind starts to wander and then you start sort of accidentally writing. You know, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm, it's sure. like, that's what I found for me is that I have to, I have to stop, I have to stop staring at that blank screen uh, because then it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and even so, like I, I at my, my, the show that I do at Largo every month, I, I always have a sketch and uh, I do, I do like some stand up, and then I always have a sketch with a guest and the writing of a sketch to me is the most impossible task in the world. Even after... I know what the idea is. I've written out the beats of the sketch. All I have to do now is like type it up and make the dialogue happen. I know what the story is going to be. I know how it begins, how it goes, and how it ends. But just even doing that is like I want this to already have been done already <laughs> and be and performing it. It's it's uh, like a lot of writers. I I don't like writing, but I like having written. Mm -hmm. Right. But boy, oh boy, to get to that part, you have to do the writing. Thumbs down. <laughs> but now, you know, in the in the new media age, there's different ways to get yourself out there. Now you got a podcast. 
Yes, which has very little writing. <laughs> that still has one sketch. Um, but that the great thing about the podcast uh, is that it can be whatever you want. That's what I love about that medium is that um, it, it's really there's no rules. There's 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 no sponsors. There's like nobody that's telling you it has to be a certain thing, and there's no time restrictions, so it can be as free form as you would like it to be. And uh, mine, mine have I've done uh, four episodes of mine. It's a monthly thing, and it and it's gotten uh, longer. I think by five to ten minutes each episode, um, because there's a lot of stream of consciousness uh, stuff that happens in it, and uh, I I that is something I might need to uh, to to take a look at because uh, <laughs> it cannot continue at this pace. Because writing is rewriting. Yes, well, by, well, because it's like by episode 10, it <laughs> can't be a four-hour podcast because <laughs> I am just talking and talking and talking. <laughs> Although maybe it will be. Hey, <laughs> so to find this podcast, yes, you would, it, let's say... It is, you, uh, you can go to iTunes um, or you can go to other places if you're a weird person who doesn't like iTunes. <laughs> um, it's called the Pod F Tompcast. <laughs> ah! um, it's very clever. There it is. There's a little picture of, of me in 8-bit <laughs> form. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's on iTunes and Libsyn and all the usual places. But uh, it's, uh, I've really, really enjoyed doing it. And it's been a great, uh, it's been a great way to, to connect with people. Now, at, at shows that I do... Uh, a lot of, because I, I was doing live shows where people were coming up and saying, I found out about you through this other podcast, you know, from, from me guesting on something. And that's when the penny kind of dropped, like, what a great tool this is to, to connect with people. And, uh, and also it was something I enjoyed doing, like, guesting on other people's. And, and uh, um, once I figured out what I wanted to do with mine, it's just become my favorite thing to do. So basically, you're a polyglot. What? Ooh. What? I've always wanted to use that in a sentence, and Paul it's F. is here. He's a polyglot. And he that's writes. That's like a hyphenate. He writes. Same thing as a hyphenate. Right. He, uh, Just a he fancier acts, word. Act, actor. Does the stand-up. I do that stand-up. Uh, uh, directs. Sings. No. I do not direct. Oh. <laughs> I, will have to, I will have to take that pinky away. Now I you're apologize. just Renaissance. <laughs> he's a <laughs> Renaissance man. Uh. He's been downgraded to Renaissance. However, he's the funniest goddamn Renaissance man in LA. That's all I know. <laughs> and that's all that matters. So, all right, so you got the podcast, you got the Paul F. Tompkins show, you got the Tangled. Yes. You're doing good. Everything's good. Everything's I got good. no complaints. No, very good. Um, okay, now uh, you, of course, we wanted you on here because we wanted you to be a part of Celebrity. Try this at home. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That looks like Mr. Yuck. That's what I said. Hey, yes. I said that last week. They never heard of Mr. Yuck. He tells you not to drink uh, dishwashing well, yeah. liquid. It, it's don't, in other words, it's don't try this, and we try it. Oh. We'll spin. You see what we did there? Corey with the graphics. Boom. Oh. <laughs> I got my eye on you, Corey. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your celebrity try this at home pick was? Yes. The wrong guy. Starring Dave Foley. It was written by Dave Foley, Dave Higgins, and uh, Jay Kogan. Uh, and it is a, a movie that never found a distributor in the U.S. and so never had a theatrical release here. Um, I first saw it at the, at the Aspen Comedy Festival in 1998 or 9. Um, and uh, I, I saw a screening of it with an audience. And I, I laughed. I don't think I've laughed that much at any movie since then, where I, I could not believe how uh, how funny it was. Uh, it's just like packed with uh, so many great gags and performances, and uh, really, really funny movie that a lot of people have not have not unfortunately seen. Well, this is what DVD is all about. I mean, a lot of people don't realize this, but just because a movie makes it to theaters doesn't mean it's a good movie. And conversely, movies that don't make it to theaters yeah. are very often better than the ones that do. And yeah. DVD lets you discover those movies. I think that the stigma, like the direct-to-DVD mm -hmm. stigma is maybe um, uh, unfairly it's, applied to some things. You it's know? starting to go away. I think it is. It's starting I to go think away. It is, yeah. yeah. The, well, the edges are kind of blurring a little bit, yeah. you know. And now you're seeing Oscar winning actors, not to get too far afield mm -hmm. from the wrong guy, but now you're getting Oscar winning actors yeah. starring in direct to DVD films. F. Murray Abraham. F. Murray Abraham. Jeff Bridges. Jeff, oh, what's yeah. this? There was one uh, just this last year. It was oh, before yeah. It was before he... Um, before Crazy Heart? Before Crazy Heart. That sounds yeah. familiar, but I can't yeah. remember the name. But yeah. yeah. Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker. Now, I would say uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., but you know what? Mm. It's over. Yeah. 
He had his moment. He jumped up and down at the Oscars, but man, is this, has yeah. he been a tough role for that guy. That was a weird slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a weird and very <laughs> fast. Weird, weird, weird yeah. and fast slide. Oh, boy. So, you know, I, what I liked about The Wrong Guy, which I had not seen, mm -hmm. actually, so I thank you for the recommendation. You're welcome. And you know what? It was funny. It was, you know what? It's one of those movies that is, it, it is like professionally silly. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not like Kentucky Fried Movie, which I love Kentucky Fried Movie, mm -hmm. but where it's sort of all over the place. Yeah. This is like, it is a very uh, Zaz-esque <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Zaz esque, right, right. airplane esque movie where they're just always throwing gags at you. Yeah. And in fact, they. But they're calculated gags. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 it's, it's not sort of let's make a list of gags and let's build a movie around the gags. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're organic to the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's funny. There are moments when it goes both ways because, yeah. like, there's a scene in the film where Dave Foley's on the run because he's been accused of a murder, X, Y, and Z. He thinks he's been accused he of a He thinks he's been accused <laughs> yeah. of a murder. And at some point, because he's on the run, he, he's got to hop a train. Mm -hmm. And there's only one reason. He's hopping a train. <laughs> right. It's because there's a side gag involved, which yeah. I won't tell you about because I'm hoping that you've already seen it. Well, yes. now you have to you talk. Now we give away spoilers because they should oh, have seen right. it. Oh, that's right. They should have that's seen true. it. Right. Why right. I no, that's what I loved about it. I started watching it and then I went, oh, he's going to be accused of murder. And then the twist, and I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> See, but it's a plot. And, and, it's and a plot. I, yeah. I admit I just saw it because of Paul, though, Jake Hogan, I'm friends with, and mm -hmm. I, I think I told him I saw it years ago, so. Oh, but it was it was great. Well, I'm sure he's not watching yes, it tonight. Yes, you know it. <laughs> um, no, it was it was very funny, obviously, and and I love the music. The music score is you know it's the old time music that yeah it, yeah yeah like know. a sort of Bernard Herrmann kind yeah. of score. And and I I watching it uh, today again uh, for the first time in a while. Uh, at the end, I when's the last time you saw this in a movie? There's two credited songs at the end of the movie. There's right. usually like now right. it's like a huge scroll of all these <laughs> pop songs, you know. Um, and there's two songs that one was written for the movie by the Bare Naked Ladies, um, and the other one was that Bronski Beat song. Yes, <laughs> when yeah. he's in the uh, in the brothers' bedroom. In the brothers' bedroom. Yeah, but uh, I I absolutely love this movie. I love that it it did have a real story that. Um, uh, that it followed, uh, it did not deviate from it. It was it was a structured, yeah. uh, silly, uh, just. And I like that it had that um, that sort of Canadian uh, that Canadian thing that is midway between the the really absurd British stuff and the more um, slapsticky kind of American stuff. It's like a nice blending of those two yeah. sensibilities. Um, uh, everybody's really funny in it. Uh, uh, Jennifer Tilly is absolutely adorable in this movie. She's like, uh, I, I, yeah, it was a pleasure to watch this again. I'm, thank you for uh, having me on the show sure. uh, to give me another opportunity to watch this movie, <laughs> which I hadn't seen in such a long time. Now, is that your brand of comedy, generally speaking? Are you? Is, is, is yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's that's more my sensibility. It's like the the stuff. The stuff today, not to sound too much like Milton Berle, but uh, you know, like the comedy today is there's a lot of um, it's very like uh, dude centric, you know, and I'm not yeah. one of those dudes, you know, so very Dane Cook. Yeah, there's a, there's stoner, a lot of stuff that it's, it's stoner dude centric too. Yeah, right? well, very there's, Judd there's an aggression to it. Yeah. It's like this isn't fun yeah. anymore, you know. <laughs> um, and and this movie is is really smart and and funny and that's that's definitely the the stuff that I respond to more you know than than kind of gross out stuff or um, just really misogynistic or homophobic stuff that is just like we all know how that's just funny all the time you know and it's like oh, not all of us <laughs> now, so yeah uh, I was gonna say somebody in the chat room is asking who played the cop the person in the chat room asking is David A Higgins wants to know who played the cop <laughs> <laughs> so he was know, awesome do you know I can't remember the I didn't look it's the credits. guy I forget his name he's he's Steve Higgins brother ah <laughs> he was in. He was. I think he was like the extra dude in the Higgins Boys and Gruber. Yeah, yeah. It was Steve was Higgins, Gruber. Dave Gruber, Allen. Yeah, it definitely wasn't Gruber. And then the the, uh, the extra guy yeah. that they had. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> David Higgins in the chat room. Yes. Thank you for joining us. He started the cop, obviously. <laughs> yes, David. Uh, David Anthony Higgins, uh, his professional name. Yes. Uh, plays uh, a really. Uh, really, like the laziest policeman uh, in the history of uh, of cinema, um, a really, really funny role that he's constantly trying to uh, expense everything and wants to give up on this case. And then every time he hears that there that more money is being thrown at it, uh, he's back on board, um, going to see Broadway shows. And oh, uh, yeah, it's 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 a uh, the Asian. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and a thing that I forgot about the 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 plot with um with Joe Flaherty yes. as uh, Jennifer Tilly's dad, yeah. who's <laughs> the humble uh, the, the bank banker. owner yeah. who's being uh, who's being <laughs> right. terrorized by the farm the, the farmer. Right. Before closing on your bank oh, plot line, I completely <laughs> forgot about that. 
I just oh, love that. that, that I, I just love yeah, that side so gag with good. the um, with the uh, the picket fence. I kept wondering how long is that picket fence going to fall? Yeah, is it going to go all the way around the house? <laughs> Maybe around the house twice, you know? And it was great. You know, so there's visual humor in it, there's wordplay humor in it, yeah. and uh, again, I hadn't seen it, and I was really glad I did. It was really terrific. I'm glad to hear and, that. Uh, the running gag of you sure that's a that's a guy? Oh girl? my god, <laughs> that, that woman? That, no, it's a guy. <laughs> yeah. People constantly misidentifying yeah. Dave Foley as a woman. <laughs> no, no. The, the, here, here's the moment, and then we'll get to some uh, get to some online comments. But here's the moment when when, when I knew this movie was going to be funny. Mm. The scene where Dave Foley goes into the office and sees the dead man, uh -huh. and he pulls the knife out of the dead man's <laughs> neck, and yeah. then he realizes what's going on. He tries to put it back in yeah. the dead yeah, man's yeah. neck. That and is like that is such a that it really is a revelatory gag. <laughs> like the idea that he's trying to well, insert it back into the slot. It's funny because it's what we would all do <laughs> if we were yeah. in that situation. Exactly. You, I mean, you really you would you would think I just disturb. Oh, I know I've got to. That, that's what you would do if if, if you. Just came you know upon what? a crime scene where a guy was stabbed in the neck. You would yes, put it I, back in. Absolutely. <laughs> Why not? You've disturbed I the swear, crime. I'm, you you've know what? disturbed the crime F, scene. After sure. the show, Paul F and I are going to go kill somebody <laughs> by stabbing him in the back of the neck just to see I if like you this do that. Plan. Are you on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're not going to know when you discover this crime scene. <laughs> okay. It could be tomorrow. It could be ten years from now. You watch. I'll put it back. We'll see. All I'll right. Put it back. Shall we shake on you it? You bet. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. A gentleman's bet. Absolutely. A gentleman's bet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. All right, Mike, what's uh, what's the haps on the interweb? Well, yeah, we Mike. We definitely have people that want to Skype in and call in, but let me get some chat room questions first as Corey sets that up. Uh, S. Moncure. I always think that he, is, he should be wearing a monocle with that name. That's Stuart Moncure, a yes. longtime listener of our podcast, the yes. IGN Digigods. Um, I think you answered this, though. He, he, he just wants to tell you he loves the pod F. Tomcast. Oh, what brought you. you into podcasting, which I think you talked a little bit about. I did. Asked and answered. Yes. Moving yes, on. moving on. But I want to <laughs> I'm glad, I'm I didn't glad want to skip it. over the loving no, part. I, I know you wanted that. That's all the That's the only yeah, part yeah. I needed to hear. Um, uh, <laughs> ask this gent, says Chad Murphy, how he manages to wear a three-piece suit in L.A. without dying of heat stroke. <laughs> it's not that hot. Because uh, we don't have humidity. But I'll tell you something. In the summertime, those are some tough days for a suit guy. Even with the su even with the seersucker or linen, it's still. Sometimes you don't want to be layered up. And I feel like I've really painted myself into a corner with this whole thing. And I wish I'd been a t-shirt dude sometimes. But too late. I've made my bed is now. There, I is there a lion. story behind why the suits? Is it just something you like to do? Is it a I'm just a bit of a dandy. <laughs> um, I, since I was a kid, I always liked dressing up because it was like I, I, I grew up in a time when people on television wore suits and ties. So it was like that's that's what people in show business do. So it was like and as a little kid, it was like putting on a costume, you know, so anything that was like Paul that. Feig says the same thing. Well, Paul, he's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Feig talks about how he, he would always, you know, he would always see pictures from the past. Of yes. Everybody, even the grips and the gaffers, everybody wore suits. That's right. And he wants to have that where his, he's always, it always feels timely and important to be on yeah. a, a, a movie. No, you know, he does still does. Christopher, Christopher Nolan does that. Christopher Nolan yes, he does. wears oh, really? a sport coat. Just like Sam Stanley Kubrick Ramey used to. Mm -hmm. Sam, Sam Ramey, Ramey as well. Mm -hmm. Kubrick used to do that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And because it's true, you know, like I, I would watch, uh, I would see video of old baseball games from the 40s and 50s, and people would get all the dressed players up wearing suits and ties. In suit, yes, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, it didn't uh, breathe very well though, so they would get really overheated. <laughs> people used to wear suits when they went on planes. That used is to, true. Used to dress up to it go was fly. an event. Yeah. Well, they're idiots because you know what? Planes are uncomfortable. <laughs> Well, they are now. Then. Not oh, oh, boy, yeah. oh, boy. You could smoke on a plane <laughs> then. How then, fantastic yes. was that? Being able to smoke on a plane. That's right. Those were the good old days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lung cancer that close it was awesome. Uh, you can only go back to those days. Here, here's Turbo props. Uh, Paul, can we get a peek at those socks? <laughs> that's, that's weird. <laughs> that's a weird question. Here you go, fetishist. Oh, look right. at that. Okay. A little pattern. All right. Subtle, subtle pattern. Uh, odd. Um, and then uh, the now. real Tabby <laughs> says, uh, not really a question, but he's embarrassed to admit he has the poster of the wrong guy on his living room wall. Hey. Why is Whoa, he embarrassed yeah. for that? That's pretty cool. No. That's He's part of a group. He doesn't. He doesn't want to be part of the group. Come on, the real tab. The, the, look, the, the the wrong guy. The movie has like cult comedy written all over it. Wait it a minute. Really does. D does he mean the wrong guys? That movie with <laughs> Louis Anderson, Franklin Ajay, oh, Richard Belzer. <laughs> yeah, he's a little embarrassed. It's a different movie. That's a different movie. Different you movie. should be embarrassed about that one. <laughs> 
No, really, it does. It has cult comedy written all over yeah. it. Yeah, and yeah. Then, you know, you know and, and it has to be discovered. I mean, you know, and Jake Hogan was one of the writers on it, who is a Simpsons guy and mm-hmm. Frasier, and he's a very big TV Absolutely. comedy it's, guy. So yeah, yeah. Really talented writers on it as well. It's been on, it's been on DVD does. for quite a while since like 2002, I think. Yes, I think so. So it, it's it, not hard to find. Yeah, it was made in '97. Uh, and a weird thing, because when we when I first started discussing this with with Mike. Um, I, I looked on Netflix and it was available on oh, Netflix. Yeah. And then, like a day later, people were telling me, "Well, it's not on Netflix, so I guess I'll buy it. I guess I'll trust you and buy it." So I don't know what happened. I don't know. Oh. No, because I, I I got it off of Netflix. It's on Netflix. It's yeah. on Netflix. Did yeah. you get? Elaine, you, you got, got the copy. Netflix, right? I have it in my hand. <laughs> the only one. Oh, the look copy. at that! There we go. There Unbelievable. Oh, maybe they only have a few copies. Maybe those maybe people. That's are liars. the copy. We also put our Amazon <laughs> link where people could have bought it through Amazon. We did have the Amazon. But link they're up. saying, but they they weren't saying like it was checked out at Netflix. You know what I mean? Like they're saying it wasn't on there at all. Their Netflix is broken. We got to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. <laughs> Call Commissioner Gordon. Follow the money. Maybe we'll get a different sponsor Co-go. than Netflix. <laughs> Not sponsored. Kogo. Oh, <laughs> that, that is the joke that came up <laughs> on, another, on a podcast I did recently. I that. All right. So uh, uh, what's what's happening on the interwebs? Any uh, call, Skyping, tweeting, call Facebooking, Skype? invent something and tweet on it. I think we may be ready. Oh, right, look we're going to try that. the Skype and then we can go back to the message boards where try. more people have things to say. But let's give the Skype uh-huh. a try. Ye- uh, yellow. Is that the, the, the little right. girl from the ring? <laughs> <laughs> Is that or a cat that's no, we heard being something. euthanized? <laughs> All right, we'll come back to her. I'm gonna go to the message board. We're going to the message board, folks. Lady Diode, who always uh, lands up writing, and giving great reviews. Um, classic formula of misunderstanding, jumping to conclusions, mm-hmm. and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even though this film is 13 years old, it manages to stay fresh with steady pace and effective execution. Wall-to-wall gags, great cast, uh, team with, and she does mention David, David Anthony Higgins. Um, <laughs> uh, I laughed a lot, uh, but the scenes I really chuckled at were the police do op singing in the alley, which we didn't mention, but that was mm-hmm. great. Uh, um, and the only question is, whose face was on the Statue of Liberty? What? Wasn't it the Statue of Oh, yeah, well, that, that Statue of Liberty is very specific looking. That is right. true, and I, I don't know if that was meant to just look like a bad representation of the Statue of Liberty, or if it was meant to be, if that was some sort of in-joke. She says it looks like Nicolas Cage. Well then, there you go, there's your answer. (laughs) Question mark. Uh, And on her scale, she gives it a nine. No! Out out of a a possible 10? I hope so. (laughs) All right. Uh, and one she could have given it a six or an eight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Stuart or a Mon- Cure, who also was in the chat room just now, he also wrote on the message board as well. Stupidformovies.com. We have message boards for all movie fans. Uh, big fan of Kids in the Hall and News Radio, so anything with Dave Foley tends to be worth my time. Um, I'm sad to say I heard little about this prior to Buy, Rent, or Burn, and I actually enjoyed it, how it took all the different elements of the innocent man frame for a crime he didn't commit thrillers and intentionally made it funny. Uh, so yeah, worth sight gag. So uh, he loved it as well. So I'm there you go. To, you have picked a great that. movie. Look Sometimes like, why did you? Yeah. Why did you make us watch this? Is a lot of times, and everybody has loved this. So can you give me one name of somebody who made you watch an awful movie? <laughs> Um, don't do it, Mike. No, I, <laughs> I say, don't call him on well, that. Gruber, oh, Gruber did the bank dick, which is not an awful movie, oh, but wow. nobody can find it yeah. right. at all. Oh, really? You can so find I the bank dick anywhere. <laughs> wow, I would think that. So would everybody be, was couldn't find it. Couldn't yeah, find it. Why would yeah, you say yeah. that? I couldn't find it anywhere. So that was really the big complaint with that one. Way to go, Gruber. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, <laughs> he ain't coming back. Not that he wants to. <laughs> so, uh, so do we have anybody calling in? We're gonna try again. Oh, thumbs up from Corey. You know what that means? Yeah. We have Sean. Sean Things on the line. Sean Things. Hello, Sean Things. Hi, this is Sean Things. It sure is. (laughs) It really is. So did you watch the wrong guy? It really is. Um, I just had to say to uh, to Paul, uh, my dad uh, got me when I was uh, younger, introduced me into Tenacious D. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I was 12, and uh, the uh, till this day, whenever me and my friends go into a bar, every time someone will walk in first, and then someone I follow the friends come in, and we say, "Ladies and gentlemen, tenacious D," uh, and they come. That, that I I think your dad uh, might be a little inappropriate. That is not uh, <laughs> that's not good stuff for a 12 year old. <laughs> you know what? At the same time, he actually he showed me Clerks as well. Oh, well, that's even worse. Huh. Yeah, really. Oh, very permissive family you got going on there. Wait, is your dad Kevin Smith? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? Actually, he is. No. Uh, no. 
But he, he knew I had uh, aspiring thoughts for film school, and I actually went to film school with uh, Jason McIntyre, that works uh, on the uh, show. There He's we not go. here tonight. Yeah. <laughs> He's not here tonight, no. Uh, but also, uh, Paul, I wanted to ask you about uh, the voice acting. I really want to get into voice acting, and you did voice work on uh, Aqua Team. Uh, yes, I wanted to know you. what that experience was like. That experience was, uh, I was asked by um, the producers of Aqua Teen Hunger Force to, uh, to voice something for them. I actually did a lost episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force where I played a SWAT um, agent. Uh, this was after they had gotten in trouble for having light up signs uh, posted around uh, Atlanta. I think, or maybe well, it was no, Boston. No, Boston. In Boston. And. Um, so they made a, a funny episode making fun of that, and then we're told, you can't put that on the air because we're still in trouble with the, the government. <laughs> so um, I, they brought me back later uh, uh, to play uh, a sort of combination angel and ghost that haunts Master Shake, um, since Master Shake has uh, killed me by throwing a chunk of uh, concrete off an overpass. Um, and they got me to say things that I do not say in real life, like the just filthy stuff um, that is absolutely par for the course uh, for that show, which I don't mind watching, but uh, saying it was, uh, it was a challenge as an actor uh, to get past my uh, natural prudishness. Um, but I go into a, a, a little sound closet in Los Angeles, and uh, they're on the phone with me, and I just do uh, the readings a bunch of times, and then uh, a million years later, it's all put together. <laughs> That's awesome. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the call. All right. There you go. So, uh, Mike. I think we have one more We have call. one more person queued up, right? Give me one second. Oh, Corey. Well, he, 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 has to, he has to hang up and pick. It's old school. <laughs> Unbelievable. I am Can we tap in a right dial-up phone? Exactly. <laughs> Wait, I, 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 I hear static. Sound. It's I nice. I especially the air. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Caroline, no? No? Caroline, are you all right? It's Carrie. Hey! Carrie, welcome Carrie. to the show, Carrie. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. So did you watch, uh, by the way, say hello to Paulette Tompkins. Hi, Carrie. Paulette Tompkins, you are my favorite. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Carrie. Am I still? Did that ruin it? Uh, no. So... <laughs> So now, uh, uh, did you watch The Wrong Guy, or are you here just to uh, just to pay homage to Paul F. Tompkins? Because you can do both. Either one's fine. Either one's fine. Uh, mostly the homage part, yeah. <laughs> so now, uh, do you live in Los Angeles? Well, I'm from Los Angeles, but I'm actually spending some time out in the desert helping my father out. The Gobi Desert? <laughs> yes. Wow! That is, how'd you guess I'm, that? I'm so amazed that you just guessed Stupid that. for Psychic Hotline is the <laughs> show we're doing with Mark as host. Now, are you guys making drugs? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, Burning Man ended like two months ago. You may want to come home. I don't know. It's just going to happen again next year. <laughs> you got to be, gotta be ready. Have your drug booth <laughs> ready to go. When the guy shows up in his loincloth, he's like, what, I have to wait for these drugs to be made? I'll take my business elsewhere. I, I do have a question for Paul. Yes. Um, how did you realize that you were that good at impersonating John C. Riley? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't quite remember where that came from. Uh, or why it happened, but uh, I gave it I gave it a shot one time as a joke, and uh, it made somebody laugh. And uh, I am surprised to find that people think it is in any way an accurate impression, <laughs> um, because I don't I feel like if I were to call up a friend of John C. Riley uh, and do that voice, the response I would get was Who is this? <laughs> um, but I, I guess I, I, f I feel like I am capturing some sort of spirit of John C. Riley. The essence. Yeah. I, Honestly, it sounds more like uh, Pete the Puma from the old uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> Which was uh, Stan Freeberg who did that. Uh, oh, really? Stan Freeberg did, the, did Pete the I Puma. I did not know that. Yeah. There we go. A yeah. little trivia. Now, what I would do is if, 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 if I was that guy. Mm -hmm. Perry Puma. Was it Perry, Perry Puma? Puma? Perry Puma. Even more elegant yes. than <laughs> Pete. <laughs> now, if I was really that guy, mm -hmm. I would say to you, why don't you do this impersonation for everybody? <laughs> I'm not going to be that guy Thank unless you. the audience starts to cheer and please, laugh and go. Paul, but then, oh! <laughs> 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 
Oh, you can't. Yeah, for him. Hey, everybody, it's me, John C. Riley. I'm just <laughs> hanging out, talking about movies, and uh, it's awesome. It's just awesome. <laughs> 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 Four, right? Yes, oh, exactly. Three, Make sure I have a bunch of lumps on my head. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing a lot more impersonations, right? Before each show, are you still doing that? I am still doing that. Uh, I, that's that's another one where I feel you, like right? I've painted myself into a corner. Right. Like I'm running out of people. I was going to say, that's sort of new. You weren't doing that before. No, uh, Were no, you no. ever doing impersonations? You just kind of stumble into it, it was, uh, recently? I, I worked, uh, I, I hosted a show briefly uh, called Best Week Ever on VH1, and, and that I started doing a lot of character work on that. Uh, it was a pop culture show, and we would uh, make fun of uh, uh, TV shows and stuff like that. And so I started doing, that's where I first did like the Cake Boss and Ice Tea and stuff like that. Um, and it just came out of that. And then when uh, uh, my friend Scott Ackerman started a, uh, a, a radio show now, a podcast called uh, Comedy Death Ray Radio, um, he said, hey, do you want to do the show sometime? You could be yourself or be a character if you want. And then I started thinking, well, maybe I could do that stuff that I only ever did once on that show before. And then I started really enjoying it. And, and, uh, and now it's like something that I'm trying to develop more voices to do. It's like a thing that I, I just had never, ever done before that I'm finding that I really enjoy in my I mean, like when I was a kid, I used to do impressions like, like funny kids do, you know. Mm -hmm. But I never applied it to anything in my act. So this is kind of an outlet for that now. That is a marketable skill. Let's hope so. If you like making uh, money. Oh, I do. Maybe you do. Oh, you do. <laughs> All right, so uh, that's a great uh, celebrity try. This is a home recommendation. The wrong guy. If you didn't, uh, if you didn't Netflix it, first of all, shame on you. But now That's is your right. chance because you know what? It's not just funny now. It'll be funny in the future. Yes. It's, it won't stop being funny. It's evergreen. Oh. It's evergreen. Yeah. It it's, is available in other places, but I don't want to say because I know guys who wrote it and they probably get money if it sells. True. That yeah. is true. Yeah. That is true. I'll return the disc. Because <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I, yeah we, you, we want we want our friends to get hits. It's not on like it costs a million Amazon. dollars. If you if you bought this Support DVD, you're not going to be like, oh, now I can't feed my family this week. <laughs> <laughs> Just go ahead and buy it. It's a funny movie. Yeah. We, we'll put the uh, we'll put the uh, link up again. But it's an Amazon link. I think it's like nine ninety nine on Amazon. That's nothing. And, and then we get a cut. We get like ten percent. We get like ninety nine cents of that. There so you you're go. supporting us as well. There we go. Look at that. That'd be that creepy. So really, you're really when you buy it, you're supporting the arts. Yes. <laughs> and it, it, it's our show. Through. We are the arts. It seriously is one of the funniest films I've seen in, in a while. And, yeah, and yeah. I agree with Paul. I'm not. I can't find anything anymore that I like comedy wise in terms of movies. And for some reason, this slipped by me, and it was great. Yeah. Everything's like the same now. Yeah. It's all the same. Yeah. yeah. Kind the last of one I remember kind of was Groundhog Day. I think was the last good comedy for me. Was yeah. You know, other than that. But this was this was really good. You should definitely try to get it, watch it, rent it, or even buy it as a stocking stuffer. There you go. There you go. There you go. So there's a celebrity try this at home, folks. There it is. Yeah. 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 Mr. Yuck. <laughs> All righty. Now here's a part of the show that the kids love. Oh, they do. They love this part of the show. It's they called rally. Buy, Rent, or Burn. Mm -hmm. Buy, Rent, or Burn! Look at that. It has its own graphic. You say the words, you get the graphic. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you say it, you got I see that the word burn is made out of wood. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> Easier to burn. Well, by burn, we mean, of course, put it in the fire. Yeah. Wink. Um, all now, right. Hang on now. In case I maybe you, what? I honestly did think that's what you yeah. meant. <laughs> I thought you meant like it's got it was like get rid of it. Like yes. you don't like or, it. Is that exactly. what it's yeah. or it could mean free? You could burn something. Oh, I see. What? Or somebody could burn. But we would never you. mean that. No, no, of course. Interesting. Never. Oh, Corey's walking now. He's very upset. That's piracy. Yeah, we don't do that here. Yeah. Wow. You never told me that. <laughs> you wouldn't steal a car, Mike. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. Oh, looks look to kill. <laughs> That Next. argument <laughs> did, does not hold water at all. It's like, well, no, no of course I wouldn't steal a car. That would be very difficult. <laughs> Next week from I, Chino, I, I, we'll be... I just but getting a burned copy of this movie is very easy. I almost admitted something I didn't want to admit. So I'm glad you moved Then you stole a car? I have nothing to say. That's how I get it. Okay? <laughs> You're good. I get the stuff you out of people. You put the suit on, you immediately exactly. just want to give up information. It's like Matlock the early years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somebody said you should uh, be the lead in the Rockford Files if they redo. They are. Yeah. They are redoing oh, the Rockford see, Files. Somebody, somebody yeah. said in the That's chat very, that's yeah. very kind Coming of them to, to say. All right. All right. right so buy, rent, or burn. Buy, rent, or burn. What there happens is people in the chat room, Facebook, uh, in our, on our LinkedIn, Twitter, everywhere. <laughs> they uh, you ask us a name of a DVD, and then these guys will tell you if you should buy, rent, or burn it. They have never seen this list ever. Uh, it's hermetically. Now sued. we've never met before. <laughs> we've never met before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just want you to pick one card. 
Um, all right, so the first one from Dan Clark. These are on the Facebook page, uh, our Facebook discussion. Please like us. Boy A. <laughs> oh, I love Boy A. Boy A. Bye. That's a terrific, terrific movie. Terrific. Outstanding film. Yep. Yep. Charles Boy A? No, Boy A. Charles <laughs> no. Boy A. Boy A. Not Charles Boy A. Very great, good. Right. Great Kevin British Smith independent film. Facebook. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's the Kevin Smith. I'm sure it, it is. Oh, he loves our show. Uh, Transylvania 65000. With Jeff Goldblum. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know what? I'd say Rent. rent. That. I'll go with it's Rent. It's not that bad. No. Tra Transylvania right. 65000. I've never seen it. I, I don't think I liked it at the time, but movies have gotten so bad that I look back on that with nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement. How does it stack up next to Saturday the 14th by Richard? Richard Benjamin. Oh. Or how about uh, oh. Leonard Part Six? Oh boy. I kind of want to see that. Have you ever seen it? Hallowed. I never have seen Leonard Part Six. Film that, that buried David Putnam as head of uh, Columbia. Oh, that's right. That was the one that brought. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that dude. I forgot about that guy. David Look, Putnam. I read the You'll Never Have Lunch in This Town Again Fast and all that. And yeah. Fast yeah. fade. Fast fade. The book. Okay. Now, so, Lance Horatio Taylor on the Facebook asks yeah. about I shot Andy Warhol. Oh, the um, uh, Mary Heron film. You know, it's... Uh, um, rent. Rent. It's good. It's good. Wow. An it's, emphatic it, rent. It, it's not definitive, but it's good. Right. Yeah, I guess I'll go with that. All right. It was Jared Harris's first big It uh, was. Thing, and right? He does... You know, so many guys played Andy Warhol in a succession of films. It was David Bowie and Bas Basquiat mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Crazy Psycho. What's his name? Uh, Crispin Glover. Crispin in, Glover. In, in <laughs> The Doors. Wait, wait, yeah. wait. Hang on a second. Wait, so, uh, hold the phone doors. Crazy Psycho, Crispin Glover. Yeah. When have those two ever been put together? Crazy Psycho, Crispin Glover. Uh, never. Yeah, never. Never. Sorry. He's never. normally so grounded in his acting. <laughs> yes, exactly. He's so method. All right, moving yeah. on. Uh, from the message boards, John Blund asked about The Jerk. Oh, The Bye. Jerk. Buy it. Buy it. The Jerk. Come on. I was he was born a poor black born child. A black child. Yeah, come on. <laughs> the best. The Jerk. Come on, The Jerk. Sure, The Jerk. Buy it, rent Buy it, burn it. Buy it. All right. Bjorn Eric Narang from Norway. We yeah. Are, he's from Norway. Ask about joint security area. Buy it. <laughs> are we talking? Are we talking the Hong Kong film? It seemed like it because he listed a bunch of other those type of films. It's so a Hong Kong it, film. Yeah, it's a Hong Kong film. Gosh, there's so many that are exactly like that. I'm, trying, I'm not sure if I've even seen that one. Um, I'm gonna say rent, just because it sounds cool. <laughs> well, you're the Hong Kong. I know, experts. but you, you gotta know. There's like a joint security area, special strike, utility task force B. <laughs> there's like a, a thousand Hong Kong films that have titles exactly like that. All like, they're all directed by Benny Chan. Are you sure it's not an, some sort of industrial training film? <laughs> <laughs> it's where Mike's going for stealing the car. You're gonna set up the joint security A. Uh, you're a thief. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Kyle Oxenham asks about Bruce Almighty. Wait, from The Aww. Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> How did he get online? On Facebook. <laughs> Nonetheless. Which one? Bruce Almighty. <laughs> Bruce uh, Almighty. I, I don't like that film. I'm That's gonna, a burn. I'm, I'm going to say burn that. No, I'm going to say... Um, a weak rent. A weak rent, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Elaine is putting that. words in the yeah, Wade's no. mouth, and Wade takes them. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. Because she nailed it. It was right. It was the right call. You got a feeling on Bruce. You know, Almighty? by the way, would, you know what was not the right call? Excuse me, Paul. If you know what was not the right call? The Apology this shirt. accepted. The oh, shirt. We oh. not the right call. <laughs> Notice the We've double button. This. What is that? I kind of like the double button. Really? Yeah. It's styling, man. Not only double buttons, but see the see the cuffs. See the cuffs. Got crazy little, cuffs going. Little leather cuffs. action. Right. He's got leather on the cuffs. Got stuff on the collar. Yeah. There's a lot of business. All right. There's a lot of business. Burn. Bruce Almighty. Wait. I'm Bruce Almighty. I would say. I would say burn. I would say if the equivalent to me for burn is. That's uh, what I, I call those uh, sideways movies uh, because you are hung over and you're on your couch and it comes on cable and you're like, I can, I can watch this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Renato Kern, who's from Brazil, ay, ay, ay. asked about Bus 174. I like that film. That's a good really film. Really good film. And that was one of the best docs of that year. Yeah, obviously it's a film from Brazil about the, the, uh, the, the hij hijacking. hijacking of the bus. Uh, incredible documentary. Yep. Really a good Buy film. It. Yeah. All right. Ors Mati, I'm not sure where from, but the Ors, O-R-S, has the, uh, over the O. The umlauts. The umlauts over the O. Oh. Yeah. So it's Scandinavian-esque. Yes, yeah, it's Scandinavian. Ask about Swingers. I love Swingers. Swingers is terrific. Swingers Bye. is great. Bye. Bye. That's the last really good film that Doug Lehman made, actually. Paul Which is his I haven't first seen film. it in such a long time, I'm going to say Rent, because oh. I don't want to get in yeah. trouble with See, people I, with umlauts. I've seen it recently. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> Loved it when it came out. It actually feels a little dated. You know Watch what? Me. When when Vince Vaughn dances on the table, 
hilarious. Mm. It's pretty money. We're going to have Elaine yeah. on one day. She's got a lot of opinions on the Bizer Ranch. <laughs> Not Mike, but you can hear a little background. All right, Cassidy Robinson from Facebook asked about The Last Seduction. Oh, the John Dahl oh, film. Wow. That's the John Dahl film with yeah. Linda Fiorentino. Yeah, it was, it was, it was her moment. It's she good. was supposed to have really, broken out at that and, point. And by the way, you know what? Almost kind of his moment because John Dahl is sort of like gone into the he had, he he had a, TV he, stuff. He did a now. Val Kilmer film called Kill Me Again mm -hmm. about a year or two before that. And um, that was, yeah, that was his moment. It was kind of just before and just after The Last Seduction. Uh, I'm going to say a Rent Plus. I'm going to say Rent. A rent Plus. Steady I'm making rent. up a new one. Steady rent. rent we don't have rent, rent plus. plus. All right, message boards. Oh, do you want you anything else? Wait, can, sorry about that. I'd say rent. Can you please give us one that's terrible so that Paul F. can see our very oh, special yes. graphics? Oh, yes. Paul say, needs to say. I don't I have say, Can you please give us a moment? Oh, I'm sure there's one there. I have one more, give Paul an give me, a give, This is not a terrible one. Give me a terrible one. Chat room? Yeah, yeah. A find, a, find a terrible oh, one in the chat room. I thought that was a movie. I got one. All right, go ahead, I swear to God, I thought you were talking about a movie named Chat Room. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought Why that not? does sound terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Ghost Dad. Ghost Dad? Oh, yeah. Ghost Dad. Last Airbender, that one. Last Airbender, baby. Oh, the worst movie. Yeah. Well, it gets banished to uh, yes. a weird void? Okay. Yes. That's worst Woodburn right. is the worst movie of the year, which right now is Last Airbender. Still, we're saying Last Airbender. Still there, yeah. Although there is another one. There is another one that Paul F. hasn't seen. <laughs> now, well, why don't you give us another bad movie? We don't have. We, I only have a list. I don't have. Oh, okay. Say a bad movie. You no, know, you're thinking of the buy or rent sort of one? Brent. Oh, the buy, rent, burn, or just the comedy that we hated. Uh, just, you could just. Oh, no, we don't have that. We just oh, unloaded up. What? Okay. We have, we have a Brent. We do have a bread. with this it's half by half round, by the way. Not this sure. Oh, okay, sure. okay. Say the next film. The next film will be a bread. Just it's to not make a Paul bread, laugh. All right. For what the message it? boards, Prague know. 500 asks about Elephant Man. Buy. Oh, you gotta buy that. No, you said it's a bread. <laughs> Brent! Brent! <laughs> Elephant Man. Brent! <laughs> Elephant Man still is a ball. There, there we go. There we go. All right. No, wasn't that worth it? Elephant, Elephant, Elephant Man buy. That's buy, run, burn. Yeah. All right. So, so to recap, let's sum up the entire show. Let's sum up the entire <laughs> show. Okay. Four films: Harry Potter, Fair. Are we, we going to review them all over again? No, yes. God, just move on. <laughs> King's Speech, fantastic. Tangled, very good. Yeah. I forgot the other one. Next three days, that was fine too. Yeah. Paul F. Tompkins, Polyglot, did it again. <laughs> Podcast, Paul F. Tompkins show, Tangled. Anything else? You want to plug? Go. Uh, are you on the, you're in the Amy Mann Christmas thing coming up? Yes, I'll be doing oh, that at Largo. Oh, nice. Somebody chat said that was the greatest thing they've ever seen live. Maybe, maybe fifth annual, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right. Amy Mann Christmas show. Um, me and uh, Amy and uh, I think uh, Ben Gibbard from Death Cab for Cutie will be a part of that. And uh, Patton Oswalt, I believe. It's an oh, all-star totally. lineup. Always, always fun. Absolutely. I am doing a big uh, show at Largo myself in December. Uh, December 18th It is a charity show. All proceeds going to Habitat for Humanity. Um, it's a little bit of a tradition. Special guests every year. I never say who's going to be on, but it's uh, we auction off um, a lot of items real and imagined. Um, last year I did, I auctioned off a, um, a simulated drunk dial. Um, <laughs> If you paid a hundred dollars, I would pretend to be an ex-boyfriend and uh, wake you up. If you give me give me your phone number, I will wake you up in the middle awesome. of the night at an undetermined time um, and pretend that I just got out of a bar and I'm sort of trying to get back together with you. Oh, that's great! Yeah. Oh, that's outstanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, so there'll be there's going to be more stuff like that. There's and there was your old I, 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 I saw that iPhone, show. Right? What, sorry? Was it your old iPhone two years ago, or is that the same year? That same was the year. same year. Yes, I saw that show. I was oh, there. Oh, you saw when you saw the, the Christmas show, or when the call was well, when was when played. when you pitched the call, and I was yes. really curious who was going to wind up winning that. It was a young lady named Carolyn who was uh, a very good sport. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only way to be if that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so Paul has got a lot of stuff going on now. We are not doing a show next week because it is what? Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. Fair enough. Yes, we yeah. will be back. On on uh, December 2nd with uh, films including Black Swan, which I've already seen. I'm seeing it next week. We wait to see it next week. Yeah. So now, Paul F., we don't do the newlywed game uh, kiss thing to say uh, to say goodnight. We just Thank don't God. do that. Other shows might. We don't. So here's the thing. <laughs> I want to give Paul F. the opportunity because, you know what, we love Paul F. The guy's hilarious. I want Paul F. to say goodbye to the audience. I want him to say goodbye to everybody. Say goodnight to the good folks. Uh, goodnight, everyone, all over the world. Uh, sweet dreams, internauts. Good night, everybody. <laughs>